Thank you all for coming. I'm Jason Haft, the CEO of a Defender, and uh, I hope we can uh, present for you today some interesting thought processes as well as maybe change your clinical care paths for diabetic foot ulcer care. Let me introduce Michael DeTulo. He's actually going to introduce himself, my dear friend and colleague at, uh, in Defender. Michael DeTulo. Hey, everybody. Morning. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Michael DiTullo. I'm an industrial designer. I've been working with Defender almost from the beginning on this product. Quick show of hands, how many people have heard of the term industrial designer or know what an industrial designer does? A couple of people, that's cool. I'm excited how few there are because I get to tell you about what I do. How many people know what an architect does? Everybody, everybody knows what an architect does. Well, if you think of what an architect does for buildings, right, and you think of um, what an apparel designer does for clothes, an industrial designer does that for everything else. So everything in this room, other than the building, was designed by an industrial designer. The chair you're sitting in, the pen in your hand, the phone in your hand, for better or for worse, was designed by an industrial designer. It's our job to work on how a product looks, how it feels, also how it functions, the features and benefits of it, uh, and how to get it to be manufacturable. I've designed a lot of products in my career, that, that huge uh, thumbnail slide of all the products I've worked on. Uh, most notably, I, I worked for Nike for about eight years. This was a, a product I worked on uh, that was all about sustainability and manufacturing. So this product goes together with no adhesives and everything pops together. This was, this was one of my favorite projects I worked on. This was a, a boxing boot for the Chinese Olympic boxing team. Uh, a lot of gold medals were won in this product. And when they came to me, they were, they were boxing in a 20-year-old Adidas boxing shoe. And I asked them what they loved about it. And they loved that it was light, that it was flexible. And I was like, well, I'm going to give you a product that's 30% lighter, but I'm also going to study the way you move uh, in the ring. And we designed a product that had traction exactly where they need it. And what I love about this product is that it was never mass produced. You have to be a sponsored athlete to get this product, but it's been in limited production for 15 years, which really never happens in footwear. Uh, I worked personally with Michael Jordan, Carmelo Anthony, a bunch of athletes on Jordan product. Uh, also with Dwayne Wade, here's, here's Dwayne wearing a product uh, in the Olympics, doing some, some cool stuff that I can't do. Uh, <laughs> but in the shoe I designed. So great to see that pop up in, in news articles. Um, and then I left footwear about uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, and I started, I wanted to learn about other things. I'm probably a lot like you. I like to just be learning all the time. I love different challenges. I ended up working with a bunch of different consumer electronics companies like Google, Motorola. I'm bringing products to market. Um, and I ended up working with some car companies, bringing transportation to market. And so for me, I just I love learning about uh, all these different categories that I get to work on as a designer. Most recently, I, I've been working on some really diverse things. This is a product I designed for a company called Arc. This is a $300,000 speedboat that's all electric. This is a, an acoustic architectural ceiling by a company named uh, Kire in San Diego. And what's cool about this product is it reduces the echoes in big rooms like this, but it's also made from reground sneakers. So we actually collaborated with Nike. We collect uh, sneakers, grind them up into an acoustic material, and so we're taking them out of the waste stream for, for 20 years at a time. And then this is the watch I'm actually wearing right now, Carpenter, it's a, a small boutique brand out of Brooklyn. So working across all these industries, I started to notice something. And that, to me, is, again, being a learner, being a curious person, I'm always trying to connect the dots. So I'm working on all these different things. And I think that the biggest overarching macro trend I noticed across all these industries is that there's this continued push towards consumerization. And, and what I mean by consumerization in particular is, is a focus uh, away from the technical, even, even on technical products, and a focus more on the user and giving them the experience they want. And this is, to me, one of the, the key examples of this in the marketplace. I mean, how many of you had a BlackBerry at some point? Right? How many of you have a BlackBerry now? No, no hands. Oh, great. But you know, I, when I was at Nike, I was a, a young executive. I had a company-issued BlackBerry. 
I mean, there's 20,000 people on the Nike campus. They probably had thousands of IT, company IT issued Blackberries. The big innovation that Blackberry had, this is really the first popularized smartphones, right? Smartphones had been kind of bopping around the industry. Um, this was the first one that was mass adopted. And the reason why it was mass adopted is because they created an encrypted server and they sold directly to IT groups. But while I had my, my corporate Blackberry, I also had a personal iPhone, like many of us on the Nike campus. And one day, Mark Parker, the CEO of Nike, came in and was like, make my frickin' Nike email work with my iPhone now. And that, that news spread like wildfire around the campus. And I went to IT, like so many of us that day, and they had a pile of Blackberries that they were giving to people that were just garbage. And everybody was using the iPhone that they purchased. Same in transportation, right? Again, we're going from a company-issued taxi to a, a user-provided Uber. And we're seeing that trend in health and wellness, too, right? So many uh, personalized, uh, personal trackers, um, smart watches that can, can have kind of health functions. You know, do, do they work better than a waistband to, to track this data? No. But the, weight, the, the, the waistband can't work, the chest band can't work if someone's not wearing it. Nobody's gonna wear this every day, right? But they are gonna wear this. And so again, that, that trend towards consumerization. Now let's, let's go to something you know, a little more technical. Right? Like you see what's, what's kind of happening at the edges of prosthetics. Again, consumerization, personalization. And so that's why I was so excited when Jason approached me to work on Defender because I looked at what the competition was doing and I was like, this is a, a massive opportunity to, to bring a product that somebody would actually be proud to wear to a space that's highly stigmatized. Again, looking at what's going on in fashion, right? On one hand, you had those clunky walker boots but then you go into fashion, and fashion's kind of walking towards us. This is a product from a fashion brand called Balenciaga. This is from Y3. This is, these are highly coveted, super limited edition fashion products. This is happening kind of at the edges of trends. We're going to see this filter into the mainstream. This is like a $2,000 Balenciaga shoe. Uh, this is what Kanye West is doing with Adidas right now. Right, so, so you're seeing like this really interesting moment where this kind of what's happening in medical could actually converge what's happening in fashion. So when Jason and I started this project four years ago, we had a really simple premise. Let's make a protective boot that one, performs better, two, is easier to put on properly, right? But three, is aesthetically something someone would actually want to wear, right? Because we know as good as the product is, it can't work if people don't wear it. If it stays in the closet at home, it's not going to be effective. And so with that basic premise of frequency equaling efficacy, we set out to develop Defender. The other thing I, I love doing, uh, working with companies, I'm, I'm not a subject uh, area expert, right? I'm a generalist. Maybe I'm an expert in creativity if I'm an expert in anything. But I love working with subject matter experts and pulling from their brains and figuring out what we can do together. And that collaboration uh, that comes out of that is where all the magic happens. This was the very first sketch of the Foot Defender. Well, there's some cool things, like gesturally, it's similar, but functionally, we evolved so much from here. You can see here, we still had side bracing going on. Uh, the back was more like a sling, and the front was just some open straps. And so, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a good start, but we had a, such a long way to go. These are some of the other early concepts. Well, you can see where we gesturally wanted to go, and then we're like, how do we get this thing made? It's just very complicated to make. We're trying to figure out how to make it. This was the, the second big revision of the concept, still side bracing, but now it has this injection molded bucket, very rigid, but we still were, were getting too much motion. And then like in so many projects, there's just a simple breakthrough that comes from frustration. We're, we're making, we're going through all these concepts, prototypes aren't working. Jason came to my home and studio where we had a workshop and I just thought, why don't we stop trying to make this like a medical device and start making it a lot more like a shoe. So in an in a athletic sneaker, in like a, a NBA level basketball shoe, you have a textile and leather outer shell and 
underneath that, there might be all these molded components to get the, the shoe to be rigid where you want it to be, flexible where you want it to be. So, you know, I was like, we're trying and failing so much with these, with these molded components. Let's do a simple, um, very durable rubber cup sole on the, on the bottom, a textile and leather upper like a sneaker, and that will allow us to experiment below the skin and tune everything exactly the way we want it. So this was the first real sketch of what would become the foot defender. And then I was like, I'm just not happy with how hard these things are to put on and off. And I was like, let's try something uh, where the whole front of the product is removable. And so our, our idea was to put a piece of sprung carbon fiber in this white spat, um, but have it, the whole thing come off so someone can get in and out of this very easily. Just thinking of someone that might have limited mobility, limited sensing in their fingertips. How can we make sure they put it on properly? And Jason, I don't remember the developers we were working with at the time were like, I don't, we don't think it's gonna work. <laughs> and I was like, let's just, let's just build it. Let's build some prototypes and test them out. And so from there we had kind of our final real concept for the foot defender. And yet so much iteration was happening below the skin. So this, uh, that white piece is uh, in, an injection molded brace. The actual final one looks nothing like that, but that was a, an early start at some of the bracing inside. Uh, to the other side of the screen, you can see some of the, the sprung carbon fiber parts. And so while something that looks like a piece of footwear is actually incredibly complex below the skin, but we're hiding all of that from sight. But now that we had our, our product uh, experience the way we wanted, we didn't want to stop there. We're like, well, let's, let's make we made the best in class product. Let's make the best in class user manual. I was pulling apart competitor products and I noticed the user manuals were like something typed up on Microsoft Word, printed out and folded up and just shoved in a poly bag. And I was like, I want something that someone could come home with and, and refer to very easily. And then let's elevate our packaging experience, right? So, uh, you know, let's make a box that can, we know space is at a premium in the clinic. Let's make a, a box that can nest and fit in a clinic nicely and someone can take home. And then we've done so much work creating this kind of consumer experience. Now we need to make a consumer level brand mark, right? So even the branding has to, to continue to tell the story that this is really focused around the user. Of course, we're doing all of this at, during a pandemic, right? So this is Drew, who's the, the developer and factory liaison meeting out, outside in the back of my studio in Portland, uh, reviewing prototypes, but I'm kind of keeping all that moving during the pandemic. And I have to say, I'm just, it's been an incredible journey. I've loved learning about so much of what, what you deal with every day. And I'm just so proud of the result. I feel like we've truly made something that functions better, is easier to use, and importantly, aceptically kind of reduces the stigma right? that someone could feel comfortable going to the grocery store or going to work. You, know, you, you put a pant leg over this and it feels like it's an Air Jordan. You put a sneaker on the other foot and it blends in. So hopefully by creating something that people actually want to use will increase the efficacy. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to David. There it is. You got it. So, so I've just met my client, but man, I've just uh, intellectually just uh, swiped right. I don't know what the Tinder or the Grinder equivalent of I don't what is this stuff, but God dang! So I've just met. God bless it. So I'm just. I don't even know why you have me talking here, uh, 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 Hamps. But here we go. So, uh, but you know, I, I just left my uh, our clinic on Wednesday morning at, uh, uh, at USC, and we, I helped to run this uh, uh, leprosy clinic. It's the, one of the last big leprosy clinics left in the United States, the biggest one. Um, and our patients uh, develop wounds. Uh, it's right, kind of a forerunner to diabetic foot uh, uh, ulcers. And, and, you know, it gets me thinking that a lot of our patients have been treated uh, like lepers. And uh, here now, there's a way forward and consumer electronics marrying with medical devices uh, to... Uh, really affect change. And, and we've been paying attention just to doctors and nurses and not to our patients. We've been doing things to people and not with them. And, and here we go. So anyway, we don't have time to talk about this, but I want to talk to you after this because we run this whole thing with National Science Foundation called the Center to Stream Healthcare in Place. 
buckle up, because I know we're just chatting here, but I'll, and I'll finish on time, I promise. So I'm like the, my talk here, well, you don't even need me to talk to you guys about this. All I'm going to tell you about is, is how bad this all is right now. And, and uh, I can't even believe that Hanft asked me to talk about this, because I'm preaching to the converted, really. Uh, uh, but uh, let's talk about this, and just very, very briefly. Um, so again, uh, this is what I do, it's what we all do, but I'm a, I'm a foot doctor by vocation and avocation. Uh, now, second generation, my oldest is going to be a third generation one. But, you know, I, I think about two great gifts in working at the end of the body. Um, one is in this era of sort of chest thumping and, you know, just testosterone-fueled stuff and, 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 and hubris. It, I can't think of anything that's more of an expression of humility than looking after someone's feet. You know, it crosses all borders. And, you know, I mean, if you think about it, religions, even time. Right, and, and so there's that. And the other great thing in working at the end of the body, all of us, nurses, doctors, physicians, surgeons, is the, the great gift of, uh, you know, kind of perspective, if you will. And, you know, if you're working out there, there's this, uh, you know, you can kind of hang out there, like many of us do, but if you're by yourself, your life's gonna be kind of, I would say, not nasty, brutish, and short, but kind of nasty, brutish, and overlong. And, you know, you're not going to be spending much, you know, you, you, but why don't we collaborate with the mainland and why don't we collaborate with design now to affect change? But uh, unfortunately, the bottom line is, is that the perspective right now uh, ain't so hot. Uh, again, this is a video from one of my great uh, mentors, Kel Cohn, who just passed away not too long ago. But this is the first video ever caught on uh, of, of surgery. And you see here Professor Von Bergman. I just lectured at his place. Uh, not too long ago in Potsdam, uh, in his clinic. And look at that, right? There's a leg going off, right? Not a lot of design there. You see that fourth year student, I think, just going off the camera there. He seems so excited to be there. The fellow, <laughs> the, the kind of the fellow in the middle. Who am I? Am I an attending? Am I a resident? Who am I? We see the nurse. She's pissed that he's not wearing gloves. <laughs> but boy, Real happy he turned the room over so fast. Uh, so, uh, but, but, but quick, but, but anyway, bottom line is uh, enough of all the tomfoolery, and I will get done on time, Mr. Chair. Uh, but but uh, I'm still just like trying to process the talk I just heard now. Uh, but these foot complications are, they're common. I don't want to get alliterative, but they're complicated and they're costly. And, and let's just look at this. Again, you don't need these data. I'll just give you kind of the, the most up to date that we have. And you see these data. Now, you figure maybe, what, 350 million people, give or take, in the United States, now about 10% now about, mm, or maybe more now with diabetes, about half have the most generous definition of uh, what we call neuropathy or peripheral artery disease. And there's maybe, right now, a few million people living either with a foot ulcer, with severe peripheral artery disease like CLTI, chronic limb threatening ischemia, or, or limb loss itself. Um, and so, you know, that's, those are those kind of bubbles of demography kind of approaching us, but if we also look at this, uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at these data. Um, and uh, we looked at uh, not too long ago, although with, with pandemic time dilation, that could have been 10 years ago now. Uh, but uh, the, 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 we looked at the World Health Organization's global burden of disease. And check it out, if you disaggregate, if you will, and who doesn't want to disaggregate? Uh, if you disaggregate uh, the lower extremity from the rest of diabetes by itself, it's its own top 10 condition in terms of years live with disability. And this problem has just been at the end of the body, people have been ignoring it outside of, you know, we happy few in this room. Uh, you know, we've been largely ignoring this. And you see just we, re, we updated these data uh, just uh, during the middle of the pandemic. And you see just a skinny and a kind of a fat histogram. And that's just telling you what's happening here in every part of the world for every complication that we see in the lower extremity that this is increasing, not decreasing. But if we go to some of the places around the world, including you know, parts of the United States, but you know, most of the world still is seeing increases in amputation. But there are some places where it might be leveling off, but it might not be. It's a little confusing right now, but I don't want to get too inside baseball on you here. But check this out. And if I, this is from France, and they definitely won't get inside baseball on you because they can't stand baseball. Uh, I'm a bit of a, not a Francophile, I'm more of a Francophobe, but there we are. Uh, I'm kidding. I, it's really a spectacular nation in the middle of its current elections. But you see here now uh, 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 not just kind of a leveling off of, of, of amputation here over uh, uh, the beginning of the last decade, but diabetic foot ulcers are increasing. And so it's like at the beginning of the last decade, uh, uh, if you will, 
uh, or I should say the beginning of, maybe in the 90s in, in the United States where cancer rates started leveling off in terms of death, but cancer, the actual rate of, can, uh, of cancers has increased. So almost the denominator is increasing. And, and so it's almost logarithmic right now that we have to deal with this. And if you look at these data, um, you know, if you develop a diabetic foot ulcer, and you all know this now, but uh, uh, there, there, that year, there's about a two and, at least a two-and-a-half-fold greater risk that you're going to die that year. Uh, and so this is a deadly comp uh, uh, problem, with all else being equal. Uh, and let's talk about complexity. Again, the hits just keep on coming here. We looked at five and a half billion uh, outpatient visits because, like, you know, I know a trillion is like the new billion, but a billion is still a lot. And we looked at basically every outpatient visit. And uh, you don't have to, like, get your loops on or anything, but if you just look here, uh, this is uh, diabetic foot infections and foot ulcers, and these are emergency department visits, hospital admissions, referrals, uh, uh, kind of a marks of complexity. But and it's comparing to all these other problems that we know are important, like cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, you know, uh, uh, all these other things, uh, renal disease. Uh, I think we can safely say it, but with this histogram, that this is at least as complicated um, as all of those others. And uh, uh, this is just cruel and unusual. I don't want you to have to look at that slide, but we're looking at reamputation rates. And I'll just show you with the best data that we have. This is just from last year in the BMJ. And we see here that we see about uh, just under 40% five year reamputation rate. But those data are better than we'd like to see, than we've seen in many other parts of the, the world. But all else being equal, one in five people are going to have another. Uh, a part of their foot or their leg cut off uh, this year. So that's some of these big data, but how do we kind of boil some of these things down to the people outside this room that don't care about this? Maybe a generalist designer that doesn't care about this uh, outside the room, or maybe a, a hospital administrator or a policymaker. Well, let's kind of maybe put it into seconds and things, and I'll just show you these and check this out. So every second now, uh, uh, someone around the world develops an, a wound, a diabetic foot ulcer, and this is getting more frequent, as you saw, not less. Uh, and then about half of those get infected. Um, about 20% of those folks go into hospital, and then 20% of them uh, get an amputation. And that's why every 20 seconds now, uh, someone around the world has an amputation. And, and so, you know, we'd like to think collectively as a family, and again, I don't need to tell you this, but I, you know, we can maybe tell everyone else that maybe time's up, right? I mean, I think we can affect change and make a difference, which is what makes me so excited to hear kind of a sliver of hope here that's really patient, kind of patient-focused. Let's briefly talk about this before, before we finish, because you're just getting bored from me, and you want to hear what's up next, which I do as well, quite frankly, because I'm just like, like a, kind of a fanboy right now uh, to the characters on my left. I know, stop laughing. This is not this is serious stuff. <laughs> because we're talking about cancer now. Uh, so, uh, but what we know is we all care about, so very few people care about feet, God, unless you've got some weird situation going on. And if you do, you know, love is love, man. I say, great, good on you. But, uh, and very few people care about diabetes, but we all care about cancer. And, and we have all had family members that have succumbed or survived or, you know, whatever, living with it. Um, but so, it's not fair to do this, to compare one terrible thing to another, but let's do it because uh, just as an academic exercise, let's look uh, just at these data. I left them in because they're super conservative. So this is from work we did just uh, almost 10 years ago, and the numbers are actually much bigger now, but the, this hasn't changed. The diabetic foot complications, just diabetic foot, not the other wounds that you're seeing at this great meeting, are more expensive than the five most expensive cancers in the United States. And there are plenty of people right now, in Phoenix, I would imagine even, talking about breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer and skin cancer, and they should be, right? But we, happy few, again, are the only ones talking about that big red thing on the left of this histogram. So there you are. Uh, this is true also, not just in the US, but in Health Canada, in the NHS, in England, et cetera, et cetera. And then, more important than this is uh, not just the morbidity, but the mortality. And you see this is a remake of uh, data that we had. We were bored in the pandemic, right? We were only getting slammed with all of our patients being admitted, but we figured we'd make a, another study here, revisiting a 2000 and I think eight paper we did. Um, and look at this, it's worse than it used to be. If you look at all these different cancers, right? Um, you see, uh, or just a CLTI or any of these things, these problems are at least as bad as a bad form of cancer. And we would never think again of withholding therapy on someone with, God forbid, with breast cancer uh, or with colon cancer, but it happens all the time. 
people with diabetes, that we cast these aspersions to these sort of modern day uh, lepers, if you will. And, uh, and someone says, oh, Ms. Garcia, she just has that sore, she's just gonna get another one, let's just cut it off and be done with it, right? And, and that's, it, it's just, and for some people that's probably the best treatment, but not for most, I think. And I think the data are very strong, thanks to I think a lot of people in the audience uh, for that. So, but let's just hustle through all this. Again, promise I'm gonna get done on time. Uh, the, the, I don't even know what the next slide is now. Actually, I do know, but now I can tell. Uh, my, uh, this, so look, we did a, a, a review not too long ago in the New England Journal where we looked not just at foot ulcers, but on their recurrence. And let's just kind of hustle through this. If we look at what causes diabetic foot ulcers, you know, you have neuropathy, not just the motor neuropathy, but you also get, uh, I mean, I should say not just the sensory neuropathy, which we know about, you can wear a hole in your foot, but also things like motor neuropathy, where your big muscles in your leg overpower the little ones in your foot, so you're, you know, you get a, I don't know the medical word for a jacked up foot, but you know, you, you know what I mean. And your autonomic neuropathy, where your skin turns in from being like a, I don't know, like a tortilla into something more like a cracker. That's kind of a culinary analogy. Uh, and then, you know, repetitive stress leads to a, you know, recurrent wound. And if you add in per peripheral artery disease, then it uh, increases that. And, then, then, and so this is the big picture about what causes the occurrence and recurrence of these. It's really a mechanical problem. And, uh, but then after we heal people, and this is really critical to, to design uh, for many of these things, have we really healed them? So check this out. Uh, um, at one year, 40% are gonna have another wound. Uh, at the three years, it's about two thirds, and it's about mm, three quarters at five years. So recurrence is not only common in this population, it's likely. So if the foot in diabetes is a little bit like cancer, uh, and then maybe uh, when people are healed, maybe they're not healed, maybe they're in remission. And this term uh, we've, we've been using for quite a long time now, um, and it's, sometimes words don't mean much, God knows, but sometimes they do. And this really does help to maybe take the load off when you're talking to your patient and, and for you, because your goal may not be to, re, to prevent every single wound, but maybe to work with that patient so that when they get in trouble doing something again, you have something to protect their foot, right, when they're doing that. And you can have them move through the world doing something uh, rather than just doing nothing. And I can't articulate that very well, but you know what I mean. So, so, uh, so, so speaking on offloading, uh, and I'm not even t talking about offloading today, although it's one of my favorite topics, uh, and uh, we have a really big uh, NIH grant now looking at various kinds of factors associated with these. And the more I hear uh, from Michael, the more I know these are patient-related issues and not doctor-related issues. But on this issue, I think clinicians, we all need to do what we kind of <laughs> say we're already doing, uh, which is to offload these things, but check out these data. You know, here we go. Uh, uh, you can look that only about 22% of these folks are actually wear using a, uh, a good quality offloading device in total contact cast. Only about 10% or, or so are using a good quality removable cast boot. Uh, and it's maybe slightly better now a few years later uh, um, uh, in this population, but there's a lot of work we have to do collectively. And I would argue that there's probably as much design and patient-oriented features as it is key features associated that are, you know, with the nursing and the doctoring. So let me conclude with this. Uh, Mr. Chair, in my last minute, uh, I put this in uh, on by request. This is one of my favorite videos. This is given to me by a, a late great friend here. This is the Maasai or something in, the, in, the, in, in, in East Africa. So just work with me. So look at that, it's a giraffe. I think a gazelle, lion, I think. I'm not a biologist, but there you are. Gazelle running real fast, not thinking. Lion that kind of knows where to be. Boom. <laughs> and so check it. And so, so now this, this dude and his buddy are going to have like East Africa brunch, you know. At, uh, and, and when I looked, man, I thought to myself, man, that's me. Not like the lion, of course, but like the, 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 the there you go, the, the, the gazelle. Uh, and uh, running, not thinking much, and then, uh, 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 but then I thought uh, of this guy, uh, and uh, th this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, late, great Charles Dodgson, also known as Lewis Carroll, and he said back then, don't just do something, stand there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're always just saying, don't just, don't, don't just stand there, do something, right? Write that order, put that thing on him. But I think if you do what Mike says, be like Mike to my left, and you regard what we do. Most of what we do is really good, but maybe on the edges we can improve stuff. And I think that's why uh, we can really affect change now in a real way with our patient and not on them. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
I'm supposed to follow that. Can everyone hear me for a second? I'm sort of off mic, but I want to ask a question, too. First is, and those who don't know me, besides being the founder and CEO of Defender, I've been treating diabetic foot wounds for 35 years. Last year, I passed my 300,000th wound. So I've had a little bit of history in this milieu. Um, what's the most important thing you can do to a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer? Just shout it out. One thing, offloading. Almost everyone in the room said it. By a show of hands, who uses total contact casts the first day they see a diabetic foot ulcer? Four of us. What's the best offloading device for diabetic foot ulcers? All of us. So we have a pickle here, right? This is a true dilemma. We know what to do. We have a product that can do it. But for reasons other than efficacy, we can't or don't use it. So let's go one step farther. How many people treat a diabetic foot ulcer on the first visit, and that person walks out of their clinic, office, or hospital in the same shoe they came in in? Most of us. Shame on us. This isn't a scientific quandary. The reason we have these high level of amputations is we have been sucked into the vortex of medicine instead of providing quality patient care. Part of that is we don't have the right products. The choices we make have effects, and David just showed you them. We're losing legs at the same rate we were losing legs 50 years ago. Anyone see any high-tech stuff in the exhibit hall? I did. Anyone have someone in their facility that can do an angioplasty to a toe? I do. Imagine that. We can open arteries in a toe without making an incision. Come on. Yet we're defender. We'll get to that in a second. So right now, the science tells us that if you can't cast, you should be using removable cast walkers. How many people put a removable cast walker on their patient the first day they see them? Less than 10% of us. Why? Patients are non-compliant. They don't use them. It's not what? Not available. not available. Another failure of the medical system. Has anyone asked, can you use this device to their patient? And that's where I found something that literally broke my heart. We did a five-year re review of our facility. We asked 5,000 patients, can you use your cam walker? 92% of them told me, no. I can't get it on myself. You ever tried to reach the D-ring down at the bottom of a cam walker with a pillow stuffed in your thigh because you're a morbidly obese diabetic patient? You can't do it. So we have great recommendations. From this year, you saw David's work. You can go all the way back to work we did. Some of us are no longer with us, unfortunately. 2010, saying, you know, only 2% of us are casting. So removable cam walkers are a much better option because we can use them. But we're still not using them. And this is following up on what you saw from Dr. Armstrong. This is Stephanie Wu and Jeff Jensen's work that showed the number one treatment modality in the United States for diabetic foot ulcers are shoes. And not slightly, 40 to 1. So what do you think our chances of preventing amputation are when we don't treat the etiology of the wound? Pretty low. This is what spurred us to build Defender as a company. And yes, we all want to make the magical mystery rocket boot that you put on the patient for free, and they go out of the clinic like George Jetson, six inches off the ground, never touching anything. It doesn't exist. So what we have to do is find a compromise. But compromise isn't just about efficacy. It's about utilization. 
So this is what exists today. And if we do nothing different, Dave's going to come back here in three years, a little cornier, <laughs> and tell us these numbers just got bigger because the populations are growing. We have more diabetics. So today's the day everyone in this room defends what matters. We're going to take care of our patients with products they can use. And I don't care if you have double, triple, super amniotic membrane. If the patient can't use it, the patient can't get it, it isn't going to change the outcome. So we're doing this now. Less than 1%, maybe two are getting casted. Somewhere between 65% and 70% are going out of a clinic in a shoe. Which, by the way, there is no data that shows shoes can heal wounds. None. So we ask the patients, why aren't you doing what we ask? Because when you ask anyone in this room, what's the number one problem with diabetic foot ulcer patients? The response is compliance. Is it really non-compliance when they can't use the stuff we ask them to do? No, that's a failure on our part. Number one was 92%, I can't get it on and off by myself. Number two was the braces and boots out there make me feel like I have a medical problem and I'm a pariah at work. Number three was I don't know what to do with it. No one's told me what to do. And lastly, I can't do my normal activities of life. And I will pay anyone in here who can take their pants off to go to the bathroom with a cam walker below their knee. You can't. You have to remove the device, then take your pants off. Is that really something someone can do for 12 weeks, every day, every step? So we have to adjust our focus. We know that the force on the bottom of the foot delays wound healing. And we're not talking about a scratch or some surgical incision. We're talking about a mortal wound. You just saw it. Diabetic foot ulcers kill people. So with our team, Michael, some really smart engineers, Dr. Landsman, we found a way to compromise on function, sure. Our products don't take 100% of the pressure off the bottom of the foot. By the way, nothing does. But we do remove more pressure than other products out there. But most importantly, and this is something Dave alluded to, and you can see, you know, we have wonderful functionality of this product, but more importantly, and I love this quote that came from Dave when he was a young man, and Larry Harkless and Larry Lavery. It's not what you put on, it's but what you take off the wound. And notice, it says you, because as Dave mentioned earlier, we are coming from the care environment of doctor telling patient what to do. But now, I don't know if it's woke, I don't know if it's because we failed for 50 years. Now, with products, that are functional, engineered appropriately, and that patients will want to wear, we can move to what we, and that we is the professional and the patient. What better way to engage a patient with their care than give them something cool to use? Right? If I gave everybody an Apple Watch in this room, how many of you would remember this lecture? <laughs> right? It's really that simple. We, do, we have to stop thinking like scientists, stop thinking like engineers, and start thinking like humans. What makes us tick? When you see that patient, you're having trouble healing. Yes, examine your scientific process, but also examine your human interaction. Are we, me and the patient, working together to get this healed? And by the way, if anyone in this room doubts the functionality of offloading, this is from Dr. Piagizzi years ago, 2003. I actually did biopsies of diabetic foot wounds with and without offloading. Okay? All of the things you hear about, 
high MMPs, inflammatory proteins, senescent cells, delayed mitochondrial function, all of this is eliminated by taking the pressure off the bottom of the foot. You don't need magic dust to heal diabetic wounds. You need to take the pressure off. Anyone, Dave included, know what the amputation rate, let's go back even better. Do you know what the incidence of delayed diabetic hand wounds healing in four weeks is? How many diabetic hand wounds or what percentage of diabetic hand wounds don't heal in four weeks? Take a guess. Point zero zero two percent in four weeks. What's the difference between a diabetic hand wound and diabetic foot wound? Same metabolism, same out of control sugar, same delayed cell function. It's the pressures of walking. So if we are letting people leave our facilities without a device above the ankle that can take the pressure off, we are the cause of their death. All right, let's not be so morbid. 2014, how many people were born right around that time? There's some young folks in this room. There we go. This is data from that far back, that therapeutic shoes are the least effective intervention in treating diabetic foot wounds. Therapeutic shoes were never invented to treat wounds. They were invented to protect a healed foot. And I don't disagree. What tools have we had? Well, we've had very difficult to use, very non-patient friendly. But now we have a patient friendly tool, the foot defender. And that's one of six coming from us at Defender. And sure, casting, still the best treatment. But if we're only casting 2% of the patients with this disease, with this mortal wound, we're never going to make a difference. So let's be part of the solution. Let's engage with products, engage with companies that are delivering devices that patients will use. And sometimes you have to sacrifice optimal engineering and optimal function. Sure, I can make a removable brace that goes up to the hip that takes more pressure off the bottom of the foot, but how can someone function in that in their daily activities of living? This is what we want to do. Let's be part of what matters. Let's get people in offloading, specifically, of course, our device, the foot defender, that they'll want to use. And when they don't heal, let's work towards casting. Because now you have a friend, right? How many, how many people in here have had difficulty with a patient who says, not going to wear that thing, talking about a cast? Well, if I had never met you, I have a hole in my foot that I've had for months, and you tell me I'm putting 12 pounds of plaster on your leg and you can't take a shower, I'm going to say no. But if I've given you a device you like, we've created a friendship relationship, you may be able to get some more people in a cast that aren't healing. So not only is this my personal mission, but as a company, we are taking this as a corporate mission. Every diabetic foot wound you see on day one gets a foot defender. This way, we can defend what matters and help our patients. Thank you very much. Questions? There's a microphone in the front. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're all asking the same question right now. How much does it cost? How do we order it? How do we fit it? And can they use it as a daily wear? That's four questions, sorry. Holy Moses. So our booth is 433 if you have that many questions. No, uh, so how much does it cost? It's less than the Medicare reimbursable in the neighborhood of $125 depending, your reimbursable for the L code is somewhere north of 290, depending on what state you live in in the United States. You order it either through one of our sales reps or through Defender directly. 
we drop ship to your facility within 24 hours in the United States. If you don't have a DME license, we'll work with your local DME provider to drop ship to them. It comes in three sizes, small, medium, and large. That covers just about every shoe size from size 6 to size 13. Probably the last quarter of this year we'll have extra small and extra large for those outliers, although in 35 years I haven't seen a diabetic foot ulcer on an extra small foot. And can they wear it daily, like if they love it? It is intended to be worn daily. I have no data on what it does to a foot that is healed, but right. yes, it's also a transition device. So if you cast someone, once they're healed in the cast, that wound doesn't have super high tensile strength. So you can use this to transition while you're waiting the weeks to get their customized shoes. Thank you. Sorry, Lee, we can't take questions. <laughs> <laughs> so my my reaction is really similar to Dr. Armstrong's. I, 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 gosh, this, this looks like such a game changer. You know, your, your questions, your initial questions about how many of us use a total contact cast on the first day? And, you know, my answer is no, although in an ideal world we would. But typically, the patient comes in, I'm seeing them for the first time. Usually they've driven in themselves. So given that not everybody's diabetic foot ulcers are on their left foot, they still have to drive home. Plus, I want to get an x-ray, I want to might, maybe want to get an arterial study, and uh, we can't do that with a total contact cast on. So, so you know, so much of, of medicine is trying to find the best compromise, right? You know, to your, to your last points. So uh, to me, the magic of this is that it looks cool, it's simple to put on, it's comfortable because I tried one on yesterday, and the patient can walk out, get in his car, take it off, put something on to drive across the street from our clinic to get their arterial studies, their x-ray, put it back on and go home and insurance is gonna pay for it. So, I, wow. A paid message from Defender. No, thank you, Lee. <laughs> Was there a question in that? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're, you're fully accurate and, and dead on. And by the way, it took now nine years and 39 iterations to get to this. So, yes, Dr. Landsman. Um, so uh, the biggest complication that I usually have with the boots is um, hip pain from uh, um, patients that, that uh, um, have a limb length issue or they don't have a level up um, and so um, you have this great well-designed padded insole. I was wondering how you uh, deal with that. So one of the beauties of the Foot Defender is we incorporated some technologies from the footwear world and we actually invented a manufacturing process to hollow out an outsole. Michael called it a cup sole that you see on sneakers and take all of our insole technology and put it two millimeters above the ground. So that the height difference between a foot defender and a sneaker is less than two millimeters. So you are far less likely to get hip pain. That being said, when you're wearing something for 24 hours and it has some weight to it and it is swinging, you are inclined to get knee and hip discomfort. I don't know about you, but after seeing what Dr. Armstrong showed me about amputation, I'll put up with a sore knee before I lose my leg. Another question. Hi, my name is student Dr. Birch. I'm a third year podiatry student um, at Midwestern University. Uh, I just had a quick question about the, uh, the design choice. I noticed in the prototypes that you guys are going through, you guys actually had a rocker bottom heel um, to the original prototypes of the Defender, but then the final product ended up nixing the, the rocker bottom. I'm wondering like what the, the motivation was behind that, if there was like a, a reason why you excluded it, or uh, if that would be a, po a possible reiteration of the, the design that you might be able to incorporate a rocker bottom in the future. Yeah, if we want to increase the pressure on the forefoot, we'll add the rocker bottom back. So what we discovered, which is one of the game-changing things, was during our iterations, all the science about how rocker bottoms work come from rocker bottom shoes. You're wearing two of them. When you have two rocker bottom shoes, you walk like this. And then you propulse one foot at a time. But when you're wearing a device on one foot with a rocker, when the other foot comes off the ground in the swing phase of gait, you load the metatarsal heads of the foot with the rocker on it. 
88% of all diabetic ulcers happen under the metatarsal heads. So why do I want to load them any more than I have to? So what we've, and this was eye-opening to me. I'd been building rocker bottoms my whole life. But when we actually took an objective look at it, thank you, Michael DiTullo, because he said, this doesn't look like it works. Um, we found that what Paul Brandt taught us 70 years ago, when you make total contact, you distribute forces better than when you don't. Makes sense when you think about it. <laughs> Any other questions? So, can, I, can, I, can we develop this a little? Because this is great. Uh, so, that's a great question, uh, the, and from a third-year student. And it, by the way, if you even if you even if it wasn't a good question, I would say that's a great question. Yours, <laughs> I said, yeah, but yours was a freaking great question. It was very very thoughtful. But can we just uh, so uh, this is important because uh, you know these, all these choices and designs and potential iterations for the future. You know, one of the other things, one of the other design choices is in the super easy to take off anterior component. Um, you know, that's an area where you could bring total contact, right? And you sort you do in this. But then also by, I think, the design choices, and I actually tend to favor these choices because I think people are going to like it better to take it on and off. Do you, what was the iteration there? Uh, did you find that if you made it stiffer, you were, you were bringing more uh, uh, load up the leg uh, or, or not? How, how did that work? It took about two and a half years to get the shape of the carbon AFO right. Um, because if the arc is too acute, you load the tibia with all the body weight. If the arc is less acute, you don't delay the tibia moving forward in gait. And also, you don't want to change the person's ambulatory function so much that they can't walk. And this is about the 15th iteration of the anterior AFO. We had to make a compromise of transmitting more force up the leg to what patients could walk with a, essentially a steppage gait. If you make this more robust, you can take more pressure off the plantar surface, but then the patient can't walk forward without a circumductive gait. So what you get is this. Not, not going to be popular amongst many patients. It, I mean, this is going to be great. I mean, this is going to be really interesting to, to I think, to, to uh, study because I think, uh, you know, we have this big NIH study coming up uh, and uh, uh, what we're, we're doing right now, but it'll be great to see how adherence changes maybe ultimately in different devices, uh, and uh, if, especially if you can kind of communicate this to the patient and feed it back. This is, this is great. Another question? Hi, thank you for that. That was very informative. Um, my question is in regards to hygiene. Are you able to clean the boots? So um, if you come by the boot, I'll show you in detail the exploded uh, view of the insole. Part of our design is one of the layers of the insole is actually a waterproof foam, so you can take a wet wipe, a antibacterial wipe, and wipe the boot out. All of the materials on the inside come from the footwear world, so just like your running shoes, Nike or Converse because of Michael. Um, just like your running shoes, the materials wick, don't absorb, and repel. Um, the insole top cover is antimicrobial, so fungus and bacteria aren't going to grow on it. Um, are they going to get funky? Um, do you have a device you've put a draining diabetic foot ulcer in that doesn't get funky? Yeah. Please. So what's the feeling on utilization of the product for non-diabetic foot ulcer issues? So post-operative immobilization, for lower extremity. Uh, Did someone pay this gentleman? <laughs> Charco. Yeah. So I, I actually have a, a five-patient acute Charco study going on right now. So again, as David led to, um, if we're taking more pressure off the bottom of the foot, why wouldn't you put your post-surgical patients, your non-displaced fractures, your sprains, your you know, Weber A's and B maybe in it? By the way, Michael's wife who had a Weber B is currently wearing one. So yes, works better than most things on the market, but as a company, our focus is on changing people's lives. And the honest answer is most metatarsal fractures, you don't need what we're doing to heal them. You can buy a $29, $40 
Don Joy boot and that fracture will heal just fine. But every diabetic foot ulcer needs what we're doing. My question is, um, I see a lot of patients that get other areas from the devices that they're wearing because they have edema, so they're rubbing in the wound, you know, in the boot or whatever they're wearing, and then they're getting another problem too. I didn't know how adjustable this is as far as the, for edema and for the dressing. So it's about as infinitely adjustable as you can get. There's six tabs and six male-female junctions. Those adjust the volume of the device nearly 600 percent. So you can, as we were showing folks at the booth, and I'll gladly do it with you if you come by later, if you have someone that has a swollen ankle because of venous insufficiency, the center tabs can be extended out to make room. If you have a really big bulky bandage on the front of the foot, you can elevate the front tabs. If you have a patient with an amputation and a giant bandage on the front, you can move the whole spat up above the footbed so you have open air in the front. So there is no perfect device for what you're asking because every patient is different, but we did our darndest to make you have a lot of options, including a pneumatic bladder surrounding the entire heel and ankle. So if you have one of those people with a calf this big and an ankle that big, you can inflate the heel and ankle area to, to give them some proprioceptive contact to actually identify the boots on their leg. Can someone ask one of these guys a question? You're doing great. <laughs> David, can I be your um, second fan girl for the club? <laughs> um, I just had a question. Can a patient purchase directly from you as well, and how would they do that? So they buy it right from our website, um, and we drop ship to them within 48 hours. Any other questions? Please come by our booth, 433. Everyone in here, I'd like to see you walking in one and, and get what we call the defender moment, which is a big smile on your face after the second step in a foot defender. Thank you for your time. <laughs>